Mum's book says that a child's first experience with death should be an artificial one, brought on at a relatively young age by the passing of an insubstantial pet, purchased purely with its mortality in mind. That way, when a close relative kicks the bucket in front of them, all quiet-like, it doesn't hit them as hard as it should. I couldn't prove that to you, but I can say that I certainly didn't feel very much when my paternal grandmother passed away last week. That is, besides irritation, because somebody decided that I should saw through the 92 years of warm garbage that she had stuffed into her converted bungalow. Like, the contents of this box includes both layers of a box of Danish sugar cookies, an old PS slash 2 adapter, and an old brass goose. I mean, isn't this the last opportunity to take a look at all her ooblets and oddities before they're divided amongst scarpering family members and penultimately dropped into an op shop to be handed between infinitely expiring owners a la past the parcel? I wouldn't be sifting through this shit now if I'd just cried, but she was 92, man. That's plenty old in my opinion. You're listening to episode 9 of Pulp, Surreal Stories from a Nearby Skull, an audio zine presented by the Sleepy Bones Detective Agency. The following broadcast is intended for mature audiences only. There's still art on the walls, waiting for some scone-faced witch to sneak in and search the spaces behind them for Nana's secret stash of cold, hard cash. Not that she had any. I mean, programmers didn't exactly make bank back in the day. There's an old collection of board games beneath the sofa, many of which are no longer sold due to collective choking hazards, lead paint jobs, and fascist undertones. Amongst them, I find a jackpot, an old-fashioned virtual reality headset, Fox Tech technology at its finest, an immersive experience funded by scores of wealthy nerds on the net. This was no rookie shit, Nana. On the side of the beige packaging are indented numerals, which report that I am holding dev kit number 632 out of 3,000 in total. I've been told that I have objective eyes by mum. That's why I'm wearing the anti-hoarding patrol badge for today. This one's mine, I'd say. 325 an hour? Not having it, that's barely workman's wage. The Imhotep Entertainment System, or the Imi Box, if it still worked, would fetch a pretty penny online. Don't think much of games me. I'm sure Nana kept it around for the younger ones, but maybe she kept her fondness for tinkering well into her senile years. You know, when she wasn't forgetting the name of her only grandson, or microwaving her poor succulents until they were no longer... that... In the corner of my eye, I watch a lone moth flap out from beneath the box's unfurled lip. It lands hard at my pigeon print socks, where it reveals itself as nothing more than a slip of cardboard. Not like the packaging at all. Bright pink, and anything but gentle on the old peepers. Immersive VR for the masses. Fox Tech thanks you. I dip into the box itself. Here, the helmet sits beneath wads of totally untouched white tissue, as though bare eyes had never even seen it. It couldn't have just been given to Nana, though. Take it out of the packaging, and there's the yellow scars of repetitive daylight hour usage, and the foam padding on the inside had been worn down to nothing but fluff and Velcro. It buckled around the chin with a Delrin clip, the stitching on which had seen better days. As I lift it towards my face, a precious grey hair becomes unstuck from the bleached protective plastic, encasing the vital glass diodes and all the miscellaneous gubbins. There's a smell to it, not the hair, the headset, and it's not a pleasant one. Disgust does damage to my internal hull of innocence, as scent torpedoes of unclean thoughts are fired from the SS disinfectant. It had been spritzed quite recently, and so I drop it. You can't just leave something like that, you know? You've got to find out why. Sure. There was the chance that Emma, her youngest great-grandchild, had gotten her slimy Vegemite fingers all over it. I mean, that would need a quick misting from the bottle of wintergreen underneath the kitchen sink. I am equally partial, however, to the idea that my grandmother might have just been hiding something from us all. First, double-check the packaging for any reputation-destroying physical media that Nana might have wanted to rid herself of before her grand farewell. They're like that. Stacks and stacks of books. Lots of kinky corner shop romance novels Nana had. Obviously, all things considered, her content would be stored in the headset alone. You didn't even plug it into the wall anymore, let alone a computer or a disk drive. I've only ever used one once, in class, and it turns out that they make me motion sick. Don't worry, Nana. 
I'll delete your search history, even if I vomit doing it. It's a real simple system. Stick it on your head, strap the four limb nodes onto the appropriate appendages, and once it detects a pulse, the internal HUD switches on for you, very bright, all of a sudden. Then, there's a voice. Not a voice voice, you hear it in your bones more than anywhere else, like hard copy subtitles being fed into your body, rather than just pumping a pre-recorded speech into your ears. Warning, it blares. This development kit will now be issued. Please ensure that you are seated comfortably. In case of emergency, the exits are all around you. It's a helmet, just take it off. Make sure all windows and curtains are closed and drawn, as more than 78% of our initial user base reported theft as their biggest system issue. Thank you for using the Imhotep Entertainment System, and please enjoy the ride. Are you, are you prepared? I suppose I am, and so I confirm. You can tell it's an early development kit, because I felt my still largely unprepared body go limp before my sight expired and my lungs filled. A surging sequence of intermittent plaid-coloured strobe lights, the quiet hum of a solid-state drive booting up, and a few nonsense hieroglyphics guide my way into the system's fully-fledged, immersive library experience. Bloody hell. Must have a lot of memory. There's like 30 shelves here, though they're all basically empty. I've got no hands. That's mad. A world where your entire sense of self is lost by choice. Neat, when you think about it like that. Poor Nana could hardly walk at the end of things. Probably didn't really know what was going on. At least not all of the time. I guess that when the company drew thin, she could pop this bad boy on and go for a walk or something. I don't know, she probably liked it here. She certainly picked out the wallpaper because it was a horrible JPEG of her own in her bungalow vast ruby roses, where each pixel had been stretched the size of a widescreen telly. Murder on the eyes, if it were real. Is it real? Does it matter? Are my eyes open? There's quite a lot to take in. I can certainly feel myself breathing in and out, but I can't tell if I'm doing that on purpose or not. Scouring Nana's content library left much to be desired. Mark hard copies of Seinfeld, a few vinyl records here and there. Not very organized, but then there's not a lot to move around. There's one game called Cloud and Comet. Probably something to show off to the young'uns, I guess. On the bright side, though, no porno, no nudies, nothing of note, not even an internet browser, nothing to delete. So my attention is turned back to the video game. When I'd gotten motion sick, I was exploring a presupposed settlement on Mars that some nonsense billionaire said he was going to build in 80 years. You'd think they'd think about it more when it came to video games, right? Might as well give it a shot. It's got all the wear and tear of a real physical box, so much so that I expect to find a cracked disc left inside by some niece or nephew. But as I'm prying the plastic open, the whole world begins to render around me in a flurry of orange hues and dry, dusty winds. I'm logged into a character with immediate effect. No title screen, nothing. Right into the action once the particle physics settle and the music swells up behind me. I find myself knee-deep in the hot dunes of a great expansive desert. I am almost certain that there are three suns in the sky, but I like my retina solid and unsauteed. A stream of this virtual sunlight scolds my avatar's cheek so hard that I felt myself twitch in real life. Her cape shields me from blindness, but it's absolutely roasting in here. For miles around me, I can see nothing but beautiful dandelion skies angular vegetation, and sandscapes breathing amidst those thick, wobbly lines you get in the distance of summer. Dotted amongst these towering castles appears to be behemoth arrivals of us. Like massively misplaced pine cones, these cavernous cairns appeared to serve as temporary homesteads for a cautious herd of scaled creatures. They emerge, of course, because they are programmed to do so at the sight of a player character. I am not prepared for this, obviously. I'm watching with a feeling not so distinct from actual real-life fear as six of these lizards start slithering through the banks towards my avatar. To propel themselves, their front limbs are contorted inwards like a mantis. They're used as oars, right then left, then right then left. With their heads, they bob beneath the surface, like freestyle swimmers taking short, powerful breaths. I think they were sussing me out at first, and maybe I had a second or two to act, but I was much too busy narrating to do so. Now seemingly afraid, but compelled by their game logic, the creatures begin to lunge at me. Only they're bouncing off one by one. 
clean right off me. I barely felt it, more like a gentle vibration. I'm still flailing around, obviously. Exactly how I'd react to a real fight of any description, casting off insignificant signs and gestures in a vague hope I'll do something spectacular. Something, indeed. Apparently a passive skill has kicked in, and I'm now mid-analysis of the bastards. It informs me that I am, in fact, up against six level 210 Drake headhunters through another voice in my bones. In this situation, I can only think of my dear, confused Nana. It was probably my little cousins who downloaded the game and then the old dear loaded it up and wandered into the wrong area where she was brutally beaten upon until she gave in and took the headset off. That'd explain this strange place, I guess. Not exactly the tutorial, is it? Level 210? How much of your life do you need to spend in order to reach 210? I'm distracted. Barely notice the monsters burying themselves back in their mysterious poop structure, probably waiting for another player to pester. A momentary struggle with my ephemeral surroundings and a brief tumble down a very poorly placed hill, and I happen upon the game's main menu. It's two fingers, on your left hand, swept upwards with an outstretched arm, if you need to know. Such a strange feeling that I'm pulled out of my own head without warning, only to be offered a third person view of my own virtual cadaver. And well, it certainly looks like my Nana. Got the gray hair, got the wrinkles, she had this mole on her nose and it looks like she got that in there too. Neat, I guess she did have hobbies. Makes sense, like I said, she couldn't really get out of the house very much. My elbows are sweating, so I can tell you that this is pretty much the same as being outside. Only I'm tired and I don't really mind it. She must have spent a lot of time here then. Let's have a look. 892 hours, 380 million comet pieces. I snap out of my stupor, filled with an uncontrollable urge to flick through each and every available menu. Look, I'm not that good with numbers. Listen, I'm pretty sure that's nearly a year straight of playtime. She's got a fully stocked inventory and a craft bag full of mythical grade equipment and max level MP potions. Her quest log is incomprehensible and its page count is almost as high as her character's level. Now I don't know what these symbols mean, but Nana's got game. She's been role-playing as level 981 plus plus Hellfire Hexblade, Zajira Mogwink, a master of demonology, pickpocketing, and two-handed weaponry. She did like pets, so I suppose the little demon follower might suit her quite well. A hellhound, probably. She had a nasty temper sometimes. I wonder if she had any friends on here. Doesn't seem to be a button, not that I can see. Purely for giggles, I step forward unto the devil's territory, and the level 210 drake headhunters make their advance once more. Slithering along, timid as before, they take their shot at me. I just want to see the scale of the character we're talking about here, you know? Nana's got game, that's for sure. But how much exactly? quantity-wise. With the skill set menu, I was able to take a glance at the combat gestures, and it seemed simple enough. Just by using my right ring and pinky fingers, swept diagonally away from me, I summon upon the yellow skies a plague of auburn storm clouds. Thunder rumbles, but it's not our thunder, is it? You don't feel sound in your feet, do you? The monsters are frozen stiff. A stressed-looking skull icon implies they're afflicted with fear like the men you told me. I watched the skies part before me and from between the two stirring masses, a great fist emerges and comes crashing into the dunes, erasing all but me from existence. The sun eventually pulls itself from the smog that I have brought about, and I'm letting the power go straight to my head. I can even feel a smirk coming across my face as I watch my own flames smolder and die. Beneath them, a literal scorched earth situation unveils itself in the form of a glass lake, spreading across the desert for miles in all directions. It appears that I have ruined this area for everybody. Dang. Nana does have game. Prepared for the transition now, I return to the third person menu to marvel at my mess. It, like everything else, is hard to look at right now, but I managed just as well, before seeking out the world map menu. Cloud and Comet apparently spreads itself across 16 diverse nations, and two different dimensions reserved for special event campaigns, making it almost impossible to set a course anywhere without feeling immediately intimidated by the scope of it all. Makes me feel like a nerd, really. One quick journey, just to get the feel of it. 
car that the youngins have it, they wouldn't appreciate the value. The nearest town is, say, 15 minutes to the north, which is plenty of time to figure out whether or not I'm enjoying myself or not. Then, I should probably get back to packing my recently deceased Nana's mortal belongings before my mother comes back to pick me up. Shouldn't be too difficult, really. I've got the combat down to a T, and I can just skate across this new glass highway. I'm so good at this, man. Just as I'm sticking a virtual pin in the vicinity of Quiet Knoll, I'm interrupted by a rapid beeping in my lower gut. A notification suddenly takes over the entire map, a huge, immersion-shattering white box. A message? From who, though? A smiley little symbol beside the sender tells me it's another player from Nana's mystery friends list. Without prompting, the message begins reading itself aloud, and it's in my bones again, I hate it. Kumok, is that you? It's been a little while, but I'm glad to know that you're still with us. Some at the guild believed that you had assumed room temperature. After all, you wouldn't be the first to give up the ghost, eh? It's good to know that nothing can keep our party started down for too long. The guild is in the villa if you want to pop in. From Pigman. Not a fan of that username, but otherwise, it's nice to know that Nana had some pals. At least, she wasn't totally alone basically all the time, you know? I see I've made a mistake, no need to point that out. If I'd seen her playtime, I wouldn't have logged in, okay? I mean, nobody plays a game like this for that long without making a friend or two along the way. Party starter? The phrase party members had appeared in the menu. I guess Nana was the first member of the guild. Way to go, eh? What a woman, really, and a villa? Obviously, my Nana would find a community her own age. She hated the youth as a concept. To her, all but her own were swindling twerps. She said that all the time to other people in the street. I decided that I should let them know the bad news, but I'm not sure how to reply to the message. I ask aloud, to her resuming, Would you like to repeat the message? Oof, get out of my bones. I don't know how to do this, so instead I click the underlined word villa with my finger. All of a sudden, I'm somewhere else. No longer does the horizon melt into the strange sandy skies, but I can see a huge white stone mansion, very modern looking, with a lot of lush greenery. The sky is, for whatever reason, still yellow. The breeze is nice, you can hear it for miles as it gently passes the brush of an untouched evergreen forest. Ahead of me is a gate, big stone gate. Can't climb that, don't want to blow it up, probably got a password, but maybe there's a cool fantasy intercom that I can use. Obviously not one of my four. Instead, though, I see a plaque, gold-plated, engraved into it, of the names of their highest-ranking guild members. Sajira Mogwink, Pigman Manpig, Pat the Liar, Crew Cut King Tut, Y'all Reap Meat, Jetta Yesterday. Just approaching this seems to call the gates into action. They react to the ring worn on my avatar's left hand. All hail for the bushes in that dreadful voice. All hail. Do stop, please. Christ. I have to do this, don't I? I have to sidle up to that big white door, knock three times and say, Hello, your friend is dead, actually. I'm not her, I'm just having a nose. Bye. Like, they're not gonna hear about this through the grapevine, are they? They could be all over the world, right? Regardless of this internal struggle, I'm still walking forwards, up the cobblestone path, and onto the front stoop. Here, I am facing the door, and I'm biding my time. There's a huge knocker here. There's two, actually. Weird. I think I'll go with the right one. It happens before I even touch either of the knockers. Just the gesture causes my entire armor set to unshackle and fall to the ground beneath me. It disappears, and I'm left in a rather expensive looking set of house clothes. These also slip off all of a sudden. Well, that's embarrassing. How do I put these back on? Why is that an option? Was it my hands? I ought to... With a sudden quake and shudder, I find myself unable to stop the villa's grand door from opening to the presence of Nana's guildmates. Right away, a set of 12 gazes seem to lock onto mine and I'm not entirely sure where to look. Probably at the masks, for a start. Hand-painted animals, 24 pairs of eyes, pull away and return to their business. It doesn't, but it feels like the world pulls out around me for a second, and I can see it all, literally everything, in its grandest scope. They're all naked. Besides the masks, obviously. And like the rabbits, some mimic. 
They are all going at it against the virtual furniture. A fishman calls out my Nana's name. He is wearing a tasteful zebra mask, and he appeared to be perched atop another creature, describable only as an upright sewage vein with the face of a lurcher. It's good to see you, I think he said. I'm not sure. He hasn't stopped what he's doing to that yet. I've missed you, baby. Our little gatherings haven't been the same since the party starter stopped showing up. There was a cheer. Dang. Nana does have game. You have been listening to VR MMO AP, an episode of Pulp, Surreal Stories from a Nearby Skull, written and directed by Jake Lusey. This production is copyright 2020 by the Sleepy Bones Detective Agency and is intended for enjoyment purposes only. Any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. If you would like to support the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com sbda. Please visit us on the web at sleepybones.agency for more surreal stories.